Hello, everyone. I'm Carrie Tirado Brayman, the director of the UB Gender Institute at the University of Buffalo, and welcome to the final Feminist Research Alliance workshop of 2021. Uh, this series, now in its 10th year, features work by UB faculty. And now that we're virtual, we're able to share the amazing scholarship that goes on here with a larger audience. So welcome to all of you, those from UB and beyond. Before I introduce today's speaker, I wanna share with you a very brief preview of a very exciting roster of events that we have planned for the spring semester. The Frost series, the Feminist Research Alliance series will continue to be virtual and we will kick off uh, the series on February 9th again, 2022, with Professor Kenny Joseph's work on the limits of computational methods to study gender. In other words, what the numbers don't tell you. His work has been recently cited in the New York Times, and I encourage you uh, to see what he's currently working on. We will also be hosting our first hybrid event that will be in person and virtual. Visiting Professor Ludmila Janian from the University of Warsaw will be speaking on transgender identities in Poland, 1980 to 2020 on Thursday, February 24th at 4 p.m. That will take place in the Honors College 104 Capen, 107 Capen, but we'll also have a Zoom link as well. And as some of you may know, there's a huge backlash against gender studies and women's studies in Poland happening right now. And Dr. Janin will address the current moment as well. And I encourage you all to attend that. The full fall schedule will be posted on our website shortly and we'll have our spring mailer, mailer coming out soon. So it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Cody Majur is assistant professor in the Department of Media Study at UB. Their work focuses on queer and trans video games, storytelling, difference, and social justice. They have published on games, pedagogy, gender and queerness in games and video game narratives and player experiences. And they are currently the game director for Trans Folk Walking, a narrative game about trans experiences. And we have the link in our chat box. They are director of the Narrative for Social Justice Initiative with the International Society for the Study of Narrative and Work with the LGBTQ Video Game Archive on preserving and visualizing LGBTQ representation. They are editor of One Shot, a journal of critical games and play, and serve as diversity officer for the Digital Games Research Association. In January 2022, they will be working with a team of faculty, graduate students, and undergraduates to establish the a Matrix Gaming Lab and Studio in Media Study, which will be dedicated to games research and community storytelling projects. And it's a very exciting resource. I'm delighted to hear about this uh, new opportunity for our students. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Cody. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Carrie, for that really wonderful introduction. And thank you, everybody, too, for coming um, to this rescheduled time. I am thankfully feeling much better than I felt three weeks ago. Um, and I'm really thankful for folks showing up both at UB and elsewhere today. Um, so I guess I'll go ahead and screen share my slides a moment. OK. And also pull up the chat so I can keep track if there are any issues. Can folks see that OK? Okay. Yes, we can. Oh. Yes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So my talk today is called uh, Storytelling in Queer and Trans Video Games. Really, I'm just going to talk through a few related projects that I've both worked on in the past and am now currently working on uh, with my book project and then also with the new lab that Carrie just mentioned as well. Um, so without further ado, I guess I'll just jump into it. Um, I thought I would start off, though, by saying a little bit about where my interests in queer and trans games and in storytelling in games comes from. This was one of the most helpful questions I ever got as a grad student uh, because I, I obviously I chose these topics because they were important to me. But when I hit that moment, you know, in grad school where, you know, you kind of had to start figuring out what the stakes are, were or like why you were doing the thing you were doing. I had a mentor ask me, well, like, Cody, why was this important to you? Because that can be a really great way of getting at the question of, well, why does this matter? What are the stakes of this? 
And for me, I have been really interested in these topics because frankly, they weren't just important to me, they were also really life-giving and life-saving for me at different times in my life. What you see on the screen right now are different iterations of World of Warcraft characters um, that I've had over the years. Um, I started playing World of Warcraft in about 2006. And, um, and, and what this is omitting is that there are other characters that came both before World of Warcraft, during World of Warcraft, alongside World of Warcraft. But I thought, you know, this is already a good number of characters to, to look at. But um, each character reflected some part of who I was at a given point in my life. And, and World of Warcraft really gave me a space, and other MMOs and other games gave me spaces to really try out different parts of myself, to, to explore my identity and my gender and my sexuality in ways that weren't always safe for me to do um, where I was growing up. Um, and, and so it, it gave me that space to do that in a place where there, I could find love and support. It wasn't always love and support. I mean, it's an online space. Um, but where I could do that sort of testing out different identities. And so you can see how those different iterations of me changed over the years and how I was able to sort of grow into myself through games. There are some really big limits to that. You'll notice that there aren't any fat characters on the screen right now because that's not really an option a lot of games provide you. Um, you'll notice that racial representation on the screen is rather limited and in, in often has been in character creators. And so like there are a number of like limitations to what that sort of identity playground can look like in games. And there's also the danger I think of in, in trying on different identities potentially falling into what Lisa Nakamura talks about as identity tourism. But nevertheless, games provide you with a space to test out identity, to try different stories and to author your own story in a space. So getting into then my work with narrative and storytelling in games, one of the most direct ways that you can do that is just looking at what stories are being told in existing games, looking at content of games, characters, representations. And a big part of this work for me has been working with the LGBTQ video game archive. Mm -hmm. And that link is uh, still in the chat if you want to click on that. I, I highly encourage you to do so. The archive is ever expanding and um, it can be really fascinating what you find just digging through the different entries for different games. Um, overall, the archive's goal is to collect all existing examples of LGBTQ plus content in video games from the 70s until today. That's uh, an ever sort of growing mountain of content that uh, we're having to more recently get, get more realistic about exactly how much we can gather and document. Um, but I'll get more into that in just a moment. One of the really popular narratives about games is usually that the representation in games is getting better that, you know, before we didn't have as much LGBTQ representation, we didn't have as much racial diversity in games, but now things are better, right? And they will continue to get better as people fight for more stories and better representation. There's some truth to that narrative, um, and uh, you'll see some of that in uh, the visualizations I'm going to next. Um, and there are certainly more LGBTQ characters like the ones that are on the screen right now. There's Tracer from Overwatch, there's Sam Greenbrier from Gone Home, and there's also uh, Ellie from The Last of Us. And these are just a few examples from the past decade, right? Uh, but one of the things that we've really started to discover as we've dug into the content in the archive, visualized that content and its data, is that there are still some pretty dominant trends in exactly who gets represented and how. And yeah, oh, I just saw someone posted Life is Strange in, in the chat, which is, yes, another fantastic game. One of the trends you might notice in just these ones on the screen, though, is that they're all pretty white. Um, and that is uh, something that we'll, yeah, I'll get back to in just a moment. But so there are still some trends and limits in exactly who gets represented that should make us maybe have a little pause with this narrative of it gets better. It does, but there are also some ways it doesn't, um, or at least it hasn't yet. So Working with the archive, I've done a series of visualizations, both past and also currently um, a colleague of mine, Xavier Ho at Monash University, has been working with me on some updated visualizations that I'll show you. Uh, one of the things that hasn't really changed though in, in all of my time of doing these visualizations in the past four years or so has been this one, 
uh, the, so th this visualization is the number of games overall produced in each decade according to the Moby Games database compared to the number of queer games made in each decade. And so you can see, you know, in the 80s, we've got about 9,000 games made, and this orange line is, that's the overall number of games. The barely visible purple lines at the bottom, those are the queer games produced in each decade that we know of. Um, and it's a very, very small amount of the overall games being made that have any form of queer content whatsoever, which always, it, it frustrates me, it angers me a little bit then that one of the most, most common refrains we hear in popular culture and in, in, in gaming culture too is, you know, I, I just wish they would stop shoving it in my face, right? I wish these LGBTQ narratives would stop being shoved in my face. And it's like, yeah, but it's like, 0.1% of games that have any content like that to begin with. So what's really being shoved in your face here? Um, this is another visualization, uh, an updated one that I've done with um, Xavier um, about the uh, number of overall games versus the number of queer games visualized as planets. So overall, the games made that we know of in existence since the 1980s is this big sort of Jupiter-like planet this small dot that you probably can't even see on your screen right now is, is the Queer Games planet um, that is barely, you know, you can't even really see it. That's just to give you a sense of the proportions of this, right? Just how small the amount of queer content in games still is, even as it has been increasing in recent decades. A big caveat to some of both those visualizations and the ones I'm going to show you are that documentation in the archive is absolutely ongoing. And this is kind of what I was hinting at too and saying we're having to get more realistic about how much we can document, at least with the amount of current researchers, uh, faculty and grad students and volunteers who are involved with the archive. This is just a visualization of the uh, number of entries that we have in the archive. Uh, the black ones that you see really growing in this sort of big black void on the visualization, that's the number of entries that we have that are incomplete. We know that it's a game with some form of queer content. We haven't been able to follow up and see exactly what type of queer content it is. And the reason for this is because the amount of overall games being made and the amount of games being made with queer content is just growing exponentially. Uh, we, we've started to document the 2010s, but even, you know, getting to 2016, you can see that there are just so many more games to research and document there than there were in the 80s or the 90s that it's, it, there's just so much out there that we, we still need to process in order to get it into the archive. So that is a caveat, right? Like, uh, we still do have incomplete entries for those. We, we still count that as it's a type of queer content. We just don't know what it is. Um, but we don't have those complete entries, and so all of that documentation research is very much ongoing. Some of the other more recent visualizations that we've done have included looking at intersections of different types of identity in queer content. So looking at the race of LGBTQ characters in games, looking at gender and sexuality, um, and the, the visualization you'll see on the top there looks at the racial distribution of LGBTQ content in games. You'll see it's pretty overwhelmingly white. And the second category is actually race indeterminate. That's a category that means uh, you don't have any clear markers really of exactly, um, of exactly what race the content is, of, of what race the character is. They don't ever say, it's not clearly marked. And so we can't really uh, definitively say, yes, they are this race or that one. Um, so I think it's pretty telling that the, you know, our, the biggest amount of content is either white content or it's this race indeterminate category. Um, and you'll notice that there are some you know, races and ethnicities that are very, very underrepresented, including Latinx, including Pacific Islander, especially Middle Eastern um, uh, queer characters. Very, very few examples of that even today in games that we know of. Um, and then you'll see the second one is looking at comparison of race and gender um, in the archive. What's really come out of this for us has been, uh, you know, similarly to what I just said, that there are some types of characters that, to our knowledge, just don't exist in games at all. So, for example, you can see there's um, this category of uh, Black LGBTQ characters. We do not have any known examples of a Black trans man in a video game at all. 
Like we, we, to our knowledge, there is not in existence a black trans man character in a video game. Um, as opposed to some of these other categories that have at least some representation, right? Uh, overall, it is overwhelmingly cisgendered men and women, um, but trans representation has been growing in recent years, but it's predominantly white trans representation. A similar limitation that we discovered, and I, this is uh, an older visualization I did, I'll show a newer one on the next slide, um, but one of the things that was really conspicuous, and I think challenges that narrative of it gets better with representation, is that it does, but also what we noticed in LGBTQ representation is, is, it's, it's, blah, blah, is it is actually getting more white, um, at least from the 1990s through the 2000s. This is looking like it's um, a little bit different in the 2010s based on the data we have so far, but from the 1990s, we had... In the 1990s, we had about 40%, 42% uh, white queer representation. Um, and that other category, race and determined, was also, you know, a very big part of the content in the 90s. But then in the 2000s, rather than getting more racially diverse, it got less racially diverse. It grew to over, uh, well, 63% of the representation of LGBTQ people was white representation. And my initial hunch for this was that it had to do with post 9-11 United States culture with sort of rising nationalism, rising xenophobia, rising white supremacy. And in particular, uh, I've also been thinking about this in terms of Jasper Poir's homo nationalism, how the mainstreaming of queer culture was happening at the same time that uh, particular cultures, and especially Middle Eastern cultures, were being marked as, as terrorists, as being anti-LGBTQ, and that there was this sort of weird union between LGBTQ mainstreaming and marriage rights, and then also demonizing countries in the Middle East as being regressive, as being anti-LGBTQ. And so I think that it's these sort of cultural shifts happening in the 2000s that contributed to this, but it's hard to say so conclusively from just this chart. More recently, Xavier and I made this one, which is, uh, we, we thought like, okay, well, how do we take the data then and start to like test out that hypothesis, right? That maybe it was post 9-11 United States culture that, you know, contributed in a major way to these shifts. So we decided to separate the data out by countries to see like, okay, well, how did queer representation, queer representation change in different countries in this time period? The hypothesis being that, you know, if this was the case, then that shift toward increasing whiteness would have happened especially so, even more so, in the United States than it did in other countries. And the two graphs that you have here show the uh, count of queer representations on, in the U.S. on the top, and then the count of queer representations in all countries down below. The blue sort of mountains, those are white queer content, the sort of green, tealish kind of color, that is um, all other races um, in, in queer content. And what we noticed when we separated the United States out was that, yes, the increase in white queer content was more noticeable, it was more pronounced in the United States than it was in other countries, and contributed to these trends globally as well. So this doesn't definitively prove that, but it does suggest that those sort of cultural shifts were a big part of why these changes happened. And so we're gonna keep uh, pursuing that as we uh, dig more into the 2010s as well. Uh, these visualizations will be released publicly, hopefully next year or two. We've got a, a book chapter related to these updated visualizations that's gonna be coming out um, in, I believe it's the title is The Handbook of Sexuality in Video Games. It's gonna be published with Rutledge. And we'll also hopefully have like a public site that people can access these updated visualizations too. Some of my other work has still looked at, you know, zoomed in rather than zooming out with a visualization, zoomed in on particular examples of queer narratives and queer content in games. So for example, one past project I did looked at how a lot of the narratives for LGBTQ characters in video games are narratives of loss. They're narratives of tragedy. Uh, you might know this as sort of the popular trope of bury your gays, right? Like it's, you can have gay characters, but something tragic has to happen to them or their lives have to be miserable. Um, and of course, part, some of those narratives are there, they are 
representing the very real lived realities of a lot of LGBTQ people who do face oppression, who, who do face even you know, violence and harassment. Um, but nevertheless, overwhelmingly, these sort of narratives, especially the narratives that become popular and sell a lot in video games, follow this barrier gaze trope, where it's a narrative usually of an LGBTQ child or teenager who is suffering greatly at the hands of the society around them, family members or friends who are, you know, not accepting of who they are, who are treating them badly. Um, or in, you know, Fragments of Him, which is actually a beautiful romance story, it actually, uh, it's, it's still a narrative of loss. One of the um, queer characters dies very early in the game, and most of the story is sort of following after that loss, that tragic death. And so I, Past Project was looking at that, how, why do we have this overwhelming amount of narratives that are these narratives of loss, that are these narratives of hardship, um, and instead of having sort of uh, narratives of, of joy, of hope, of queer community. Um, and yeah, so, so that's one of my past studies of narrative and games. A current one sort of building on that is looking at examples of queer environments in video games. And, and what I mean by a queer environment is it's an environment that in some way is anti-normative. It's an environment in some way that has failed or that is haunted. Or, um, and it's also an environment that has LGBTQ characters in it. So both of the games on the screen are, are two of my case studies um, in this project. The Vanishing of Ethan Carter, you'll notice that I keep com coming back to Vanishing. I, I love that game. You'll see a screenshot of it in a moment. It's, it's beautiful. But um, both of these are stories that take place in kind of like Rust Belt America. They take place in post-industrial spaces where a lot of the industry has left. It's economically depressed. And um, LGBTQ characters are kind of left in these like haunted spaces to try and uh, find community, friendship, love, support for themselves and for um, others around them. And so that's what I mean by a queer environment. It, it's, it, it has those characters in it. And then it also has these other sort of elements of failure, anti-normativity, like these are not success stories. They're not stories of progress. This is a, um, a screenshot of The Vanishing of Ethan Carter. It takes place in Red Creek Valley, which is, in the game, it's supposed to be in Wisconsin. Uh, it's a fictional space, uh, but you can see that this is, you know, an old bridge that's mostly falling apart. The, the train, it's an old train bridge. You can see the rusted train tracks. If we moved a little forward here, we'd be able to see out onto the valley and some of the abandoned industrial sites, um, including a hydroelectric, a hydroelectric plant. Um, a mine and some other spaces. And it's these sort of haunted spaces, I think, that really resonate with the queer narratives. They provide a space for, a space for haunting, a space for loss, um, and often also a space of hardship. A lot of the characters in these places are surrounded by people who are not necessarily supportive of LGBTQ people, or as they would probably call them in these spaces, lifestyles. Um, and so the, the characters are going through like those sorts of experiences. What really interests me too is there's a tendency in these spaces of the nature, the environment of the space itself becoming personified in some way. So for example, in Night in the Woods, and I don't, I'm hoping I don't spoil either of these games too much. Please go play them. They're wonderful. In Night in the Woods, there's sort of this, uh, like chthonic entity that lives in the mines that you know like is awakening and threatening the townspeople um, it's called the black goat in night in the woods in the vanishing of ethan carter similarly there's the sleeper this sort of uh, again like a chthonic entity that is rising out of nature to threaten people in the valley so it's interesting to me that there's this trend too of uh, we've got these rust belt spaces, they're economically depressed, they're spaces of ruin, and they're also spaces of like nature coming back with a vengeance, of the environment rising up to uh, challenge not just the queer characters in these spaces, but also their, you know, their family, their friends, the people in the towns that they live in. And so that's a current project that I'm, I'm working on. Um, I'm actually overdue on the deadline, don't tell nobody. Um, okay, so 
those are some of my projects that are directly related to queer representation and queer content in games. But my current book project is not just looking at the content, it's not just looking at when there are characters on the screen that are LGBTQ, it's also looking at narrative, it's looking at narrative structure, the forms of storytelling in games, um, and I'll get a little bit more into what I mean like that in just a second. Part of my current work is also trying to disentangle the differences between trans and queer, right, as trans studies has done now for quite some time, because as much as trans and queer are very related identities, or at least they can be, they don't necessarily refer to the same thing. And there are trans people who don't identify as queer, there are certainly plenty of queer people who are not trans, and so it's trying to disentangle those two things while keeping a relationality between them, right? Um, that's been particularly diff difficult for me in my own narrative, given that I ascribe to both identities. Both are very important aspects of me and who I am. Um, but nevertheless, in theorizing about these narratives and looking at their structures, I also want to keep that distinction in mind, right? That there are some things that might be very important to the form of trans stories that aren't necessarily going to connect or be the same as the forms of stories in queer storytelling. So queer narrative theory, uh, queer narrative structure, as it's been discussed for the past several decades, usually emphasizes that a queer story is one that is anti-normative in some way. It doesn't follow the sort of the traditional patterns. It resists the, especially things like the marriage plot, for example, or, you know, the, the hero's journey uh, where the hero sets out and you know, saves the day and comes back and everyone's happy. It resists those sort of like narrative forms and instead emphasizes something different, right? It might be a narrative of failure. It might be, you know, a narrative of a different type of relationship or friendship or community. They are also often uh, described as being anti-teleological, meaning that they don't have sort of one set outcome or destination in mind, right? There is no, you know, okay, we beat the bad guy and we saved the day. Rather, there's they, they aren't necessarily headed anywhere, or maybe they're headed in, to mul in multiple directions, to multiple possible outcomes, but there isn't, you know, one set outcome for the narrative, and that they're nonlinear in, uh, in, in that way as well, that there might be different paths to take in the narrative, different perspectives to take that aren't necessarily headed in any one direction. And so that's glossing a lot of, you know, queer narrative theory there. But one of the challenges, one of the questions I've had as I think about narrative in these sort of abstract and theoretical ways is that if we define queer narrative as narratives that are anti-normative, they're anti-teleological, they're non-linear, does that mean that any narrative that has those attributes is inherently or automatically a queer narrative? So like, for example, if you think about like a, a show like Bandersnatch on uh, Netflix's show, right? It's a non-linear show where you're making choices as you go through it. And, um, and it can end up in a bunch of different places, right? It's, it's very sort of non-teleological in a sense, it's non-linear. Is Bandersnatch an inherently queer narrative uh, because of its structure, because of its form? And part of why I really struggle with this is I think if something is queer, primarily in its form, but not in its content, that can get us to some really weird spaces. Um, and what I mean by that is that, um, for, for example, uh, there's this game Gone Home that I've used in my work before, very popular queer game. Um, it is a game that is about sort of a teenage lesbian romance, at least in parts of it, but the, the lesbian teenagers are not present in the space at all. It's a, it's a story that's told in their absence. They do not get to exist in the game except as sort of these disembodied bits of narration. And I once had uh, one of my uh, mentors ask me like, oh, well, isn't that maybe like the queerest game of all then? Because like Gone Home, you know, it's this space that is like haunted by queer people and they're not there. So maybe it's, it's even queerer because of that. But that's always sat that hasn't sat well with me, right? Because like if the queerest narrative is the one where queer people are not present, I think that that gets us into some problems, right? I, I, I can pretty easily imagine some alt-right taglines that would really love that, right? Like, well, the queerest space of all is the place where there are no queer people. Yay, we've done it. Um, and so I think if queerness only exists on this sort of theoretical or abstract level, 
that gets us into those sort of weird and problematic spaces where I have to question who it's for. Like, is it actually for supporting queer people in their lives if the queerest stories are the ones where we're not there? Um, and so that's a challenge that I have for myself. It's a question I'm still thinking through with my current book project as I pursue some of these theoretical approaches to storytelling. Uh, so a couple of the concepts that I deal with in this book project, um, for me, a part of answering that challenge is to really focus in on the embodied experiences of LGBTQ people in video games and in, in other media as well. So you can't really have a story uh, of a, a super queer story about LGBTQ people without there being an embodied presence of LGBTQ people, right? Um, and so a couple of concepts that I've been thinking about related to this are what I call narrative difference, and then also thinking about embodiment. Um, what I mean by narrative difference is that all of us are embodied differently, that we experience the world around us differently, and thus we tell stories differently, uh, both just in terms of the content of our stories, but then also maybe in our approach to storytelling itself, that we approach that differently. So as much as narrative or storytelling might be, you know, we might call the cognitive universal, that humans think in terms of narratives, we might call the cultural universal, and that almost every human culture has some form of storytelling to it. As much as those things might be true, and might is a pretty big qualifier there for me, um, what's really important is the different ways that we do those things, the different ways that we have embodied experiences of storytelling, the different ways that our bodies experience the world, and the different ways that our bodies tell our stories. Um, and so this is a really key concept for me in thinking about narrative is it's embodied and it's also different. Um, Video games are a wonderful medium for exploring this because every player has a different experience with a game, right? Even a super linear game, different players are going to interpret it differently. They might overcome the challenges in different ways. They might think their way through the spaces differently. And so uh, another visualization project I've done has looked at different players' experiences with games. It's visualized those things to see the differences between different players. Um, and use those to think about like how much difference is possible in any given video game, how much difference there can be from player to player. Uh, that piece was published, I don't know, the pandemic is a time warp. I think it was last year in Digital Humanities Quarterly, um, and I won't talk more about it here for purposes of time, um, but definitely go check that out if you're interested um, in that vis visualizations of playthroughs, and that's also going to be part of uh, my current book project. Um, for what, what I do want to talk about today, I really want to focus in on representing narrative difference and queer and trans embodiment in games in different mediated and always already limited forms. There are always limitations sort of to how this narrative difference can manifest. Oh, sorry, I was showing everyone my Darth Vader massive coffee mug. Um, so the example that I'll talk through is this game that I love and keep coming back to, uh, Vanishing of Ethan Carter. The Vanishing of Ethan Carter tells the story of the disappearance of a boy named Ethan Carter who uh, loves telling stories. You play as Paul Prospero, uh, a paranormal detective who receives a letter from Ethan asking him to come to Red Creek Valley and, and find him, right, to, to come and save him. And so Paul Prospero is a paranormal detective. He can sense things in the environment and in clues that he puts together to solve a series of crimes and a series of murders in the valley to try and figure out what happened to Ethan, where Ethan is. So the image on the screen right now is one of one of those sort of crime scene investigations. You, you go into this sort of like spectral vision mode where you can see past events, you can start to link clues together and develop a narrative of what exactly happened in the space. Uh, I think that this is a good example. I mean, it's a good but also limited example of what embodied difference can look like, right? The, the entire narrative of this game hinges on you are embodied as a paranormal detective, right? You are embodied as a person that has special abilities that let you sense and experience the environment around you in a certain way. And I think that that is part of that idea of narrative difference, right? And the different embodied experiences that go into storytelling. 
my approach to narrative, my theory of narrative is that narrative is a sort of, it's an embodied cognitive process that allows us to encounter the world around us and sequence the things that we encounter into meaningful chains, into meaningful narratives for ourselves. So as you are exploring the crime scenes as Paul Prospero, you're putting these clues together in particular orders. You're interpreting that space and creating a narrative for yourself as you go through that space. Here's a, an example of, you know, you encounter one of the clues in the environment and you get these sort of visual representations of thoughts um, that you, and like they end up sort of coalescing into like, oh yeah, and here's what happened here. You'll see that, I don't think that th this is both a good and a bad example because like all of the thoughts here are apparently rock, like rock, 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 rock. It kind of feels like the Finding Nemo seagulls. They're like mine, 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 mine. So I don't think that that's exactly what this process looks like, but uh, rather that narrative is this, uh, you know, you're encountering things in the, the environment and you're having thoughts that you are sequencing into meaningful chains, right? Sequencing into meaningful narratives that help you understand the space around you, understand what happened in that space, um, and also make decisions about what you're going to do next based on that. Uh, one really helpful model, I think, for understanding this process is what's called 4E cognition. Um, and this uh, model of cognition is coming out of recent, and by recent I mean like over about the past decade or so, um, cognitive neuroscience and cognitive psychology. The four E's part stands for embodied, embedded, inactive, and extended. And this is basically a model that says that our cognition is not just based in our brains, it is based uh, on a lot more than that, right? It's based on all parts of our body, it's based on all parts of our embodied experience of the world around us, that it can also be based, our cognition is also based on social interactions with the world around us, with other people in the world around us. And what I like a lot about this 4E cognitive model is when I first started getting interested in cognitive neuroscience, uh, there were some real big limitations, I think, with how models of cognition were talked about. Uh, one of those limitations was that it was often sort of talked about in this universal sort of way, right? Like there's one universal sort of human brain, everybody has a brain and it looks like this. And, you know, cognition happens in this one sort of universal way. And then everybody's sort of brain does this thing that makes them allow to, you know, gives them consciousness and allows them to think about the world around them. Uh, as much as there are some things I think that we can generalize about that, I like that the 4E cognition model really resists that. It says, well, no, there are many different uh, embodied experiences of the world. There are many different brains uh, that experience the world differently, right? Even if they might have the same sort of brain regions and similarities in some of the ways that their thinking happens. Um, basically, I think that this 4E cognition model makes it much, it's a much better model for accounting for our embodied differences and also for encountering, uh, encountering and thinking about how we experience the world around us differently, right? Because it doesn't even just locate it just in one person's body, but also in their interactions with the world around them. Uh, the example, this screenshot uh, is just another sort of crime scene you encounter where you are looking around this environment in a church graveyard for clues and there's a blood stain. Um, different people could react to the same stimuli here very differently, right? They might see this as, oh, here's another crime to solve. I'm going to jump right in. They could see it as, there's blood on this wall. This is a threat. I'm not going to stay here. Um, and I think that we would have, uh, different people would have different responses to this based on things like past experiences, based on past stories they had encountered, um, and in a whole host of different potential factors, right? And 4E cognitive models make it, uh, are much more able to account for those sorts of differences than past models that tended to universalize. Part of this narrative model that I'm building is, is also about being embodied in social spaces, right? That it's not just about one person and their body, mind experiencing the world around them. It's also about them being in relationship to each other, 
um, and the differences encountered in those relationships. So in video games, I think we often see this both represented in the environment, you know, spaces where even if there aren't people present, they're kind of haunted like this scene is, you know, an old train station where clearly there used to be people here, there aren't any more, but it's still a social space you are experiencing and might have, again, different responses to based on your past experiences. But being embodied in social spaces speaks to how cognition is never just individual either, it's also relational. As we build our narratives, we're doing so in relationship to each other. Um, and so I think that social dimension of, of narrative and narrative cognition is really important here as well. As we're navigating these game environments, I think that we're not just navigating game space, we're navigating signs and symbols, we're building narratives, we're also navigating identities, like, you know, with those examples I showed earlier, with, uh, you know, my own sort of uh, identity narrative with video games, right? Uh, as we're encountering things, we're sequencing them together into our own stories as part of that navigation. And we're also potentially building new worlds. Part of the vanishing of Ethan Carter's story is also imagining sort of these fantastic narratives about what the future and other worlds could be. I think that that's important as well. So I'm gonna try to move through the next parts pretty a uh, little quicker because I wanna make sure we have plenty of time for discussion and questions, um, even though these next parts are super important to me, but you know, we're gonna make it work. Um, so in disentangling queer from trans stories, I think that queer storytelling can do a lot of these things through nonlinear uh, nonlinear forms. They don't have set outcomes to them. You know, all of these things have been characterized as queer narratives, but then trans narratives offer some differences to that as well. Maybe some challenges or um, corrections. Like for example, Alora Horak has talked about hormone time in trans narratives, uh, how narratives of transitioning, sometimes they are teleological, right? Sometimes they do have a set outcome. You know, you might be transitioning to a particular gender or a particular gender expression in the world. And so I, I think that that's, that's one key difference potentially between these two things is that trans narratives aren't necessarily queer in that sense. They might have a set destination. Um, and if I had to characterize trans narratives, I think that they are much more relational. They're not necessarily about anti-normativity, about just being, you know, uh, we're anti this norm, but rather they are relational in how they are navigating systems of power, whether they be medical, technological, or narrative. Um, they're thinking about not just resisting or uh, imagining other than norms, but they're about repurposing norms, you know, trying to uh, reclaim them and use them differently for yourself as well. So uh, another project, I, I guess I just, I, I said less, yes to a lot of projects. Um, a current trans narrative special issue project I'm working on with uh, Chiara Pellegrini is looking at what a trans narrative theory would look like, you know, might be characterized by transition and change. It might be characterized by fluidity and non-binary structures, characterized by relationality, um, it's both individual expression and also community responsibility, a responsibility to each other for community and care. And it's about navigation of norms of the past, of the present and the future, and of systems of power. That all of these are potential ways to characterize a trans narrative that are related to queer narratives, but aren't necessarily the same thing. Uh, my team and I have been working on this game called Trans Folks Walking that tries to put some of these sort of ideas into practice, but more importantly is trying to create a game that is a collection of trans experiences and stories. And each level is a different experience. The first level is a bathroom experience of having to choose between binary bathroom options in a school library. The second level is a church narrative uh, where you are playing as a trans woman who comes back to the church that she grew up in and is sort of navigating those memories and, and piecing together those memories and figuring out how she relates to her faith in this space that was important to her. And each level is going to be a different sort of short experience like that, uh, crafted with uh, in relationship to community members. Uh, so for example, level two, I'm really excited. We're working with a trans elder in Buffalo who's going to, who has shared her story for the level and is also going to be recording voice lines for the level. And 
my hope is not just that my team and I are working on this game, you know, for ourselves, but that this is a community sort of design and development project, right? Where people can contribute their stories and, um, and have control over those stories as they become part of the project too, that they get to help design what that story looks like in a game form. Um, I'll quickly show some screenshots. I won't necessarily talk about the ideas because I want to save time for questions and discussion. Here's the bathroom level. We've been thinking a lot about how you are embodied in the space and also weirdly disembodied because it's a first person game. So you don't actually see your player character body. And that is a weird experience of disembodiment at the same time. So we've been thinking about how we keep embodied in those spaces. We've been thinking about how to represent relationality, community, and care in these spaces. Uh, this is a moment where you encounter one of the sanitary receptacles in the women's bathroom. Um, and the comment that's on the screen is, you know, I wish we had these in both bathrooms. Some men need these as well. Um, and so it's trying to both point to different relationships and connections between genders, between people in the community. And then finally, emphasizing navigation, you know, how we navigate our identities, these social spaces, and the stories that we build for ourselves as well. So trans folks walking is ongoing. Um, I think I'll post that link in the chat again really quick too. This, I will say that the, the alpha demo that's available there is at this point an old one. Our internal build has advanced quite a bit beyond that. We're hoping to have a first full release of the game in early 2022. Um, we'd hope to by the end of this year, but you know, it, pandemic, it didn't quite happen. Uh, but we're hoping to in the next, you know, several months to have our first full release of the game with three complete levels. Um, and so keep an eye out on that itch.io page for that. I'm also, um, the Omatrix Gaming Lab and Studio is this uh, going to be a studio, a lab in DMS that's gonna be dedicated to commun community storytelling and gaming and virtual reality. And uh, one of the projects in, that will be in that space is an ongoing grant research project uh, done with the Andrew Mellon Foundation and the Digital Humanities and Literary Cognition Lab at Michigan State. It's a study of creativity during the pandemic, um, how people took up new forms of creative practice. Um, oh, thank you so much, Sarabi, for uh, uh, sharing that. Um, and, and so it, it, like if you took up literally anything in the pandemic, like you started baking for the first time or you, you know, started doing coloring books or watercoloring or um, pottery, sculpting, if you started gardening for the first time in the pandemic, this research project is trying to look at those creative practices that people uh, took up during the pandemic um, for various reasons. And so there's a survey at that link. If, you're, um, if you can share that with others, if you can go fill it out yourself. And we have a very broad sort of definition of what counts as creativity there. So if you started anything new in the pandemic creative, please, we would love to hear your story and your perspective for this project. Um, and then finally, if you have any like ideas for the lab related to any of the things I've talked about, I know it's been a bit of a whirlwind tour, but if you have any ideas for that or you know future collaborations, please reach out. I always love to have these uh, conversations um, and, and I always love meeting new people and hearing new ideas. So anyway, thank you so much, everybody. And I really look forward to some questions and conversations. Thank you, Cody. That was a fantastic talk really great overview and I can't believe how many projects you have going and they're all exciting and groundbreaking. I was really intrigued by the distinction between queer narrative and trans narrative because coming from a literary background, I hear postmodernism for queer narrative, the idea of anti-teleological disjuncture and all that, and more of a, of a conventional realist narrative for, for the trans narrative and I, I that was sort of an immediate situation I association I had and then I have a follow-up and I, I'll, I'll save that but I just wanted to get your impression can it so easily fall into the conventional markers of postmodern versus realism that's a really great question um I think that yeah I would definitely locate like you do the queer with the postmodern um and especially yeah, especially in its sort of anti-normative desires in, in its experimentation too. Mm -hmm. um, not to say that trans narratives don't involve experimentation, they do, but 
there's something there that like qualitatively feels different. I don't know if I would locate trans with realist necessarily. Um, but it would be honestly like the way that I think about this is going to be like super like, I don't know, half baked or, you know, not complete yet. But um, the way that I think about trans narrative is almost like maybe like a mediator between those two things, right? It's, I wouldn't consider it necessarily like a realist narrative, but it is thinking in more relational terms with a realist narrative, with the sort of social dynamics that realist narratives often represent. Um, and it's trying to reclaim some of those things for its own purposes, right? Um, and when I say its own purposes, that's not necessarily individualist. That's also, you know, community-based. It's collective as well. Um, oh, yeah, uh, Becky, I can definitely stop sharing if that helps folks see each other a bit better, too. Um, but yeah, so I, I like I, I see the the trans narrative in, in in putting this in terms of queer theory and queer studies too. I see the trans narratology that we're thinking about as it's kind of um, for me at least it's mediating between that sort of no future like um, approach to queer theory, right? Like where it's all anti normative, it's anti futurity, it's anti these things, and then a more sort of like hopeful take that we get from Munoz, right? With uh, cruising utopia, imagining queer futures. I see the trans narrative as sort of inhabiting a space in between in relationship to both of those things, right? Uh, but that's also that like, that's where it feels like for me, I, I think that other folks would have probably different answers for, you know, what would characterize a trans narrative or where they would put it in relationship to some of these ideas. Yeah, thank you. And I, I just will open up the floor and I just wanna just throw out here, when I think of trans narrative, I think of autobiography, Michelle T's work, Juliet Jack's book, um, Trans, a memoir, a lot of it is the genre of, of memoir autobiography. It is, and, and I would say too, really quickly, that that's the case in games too. A lot of mm -hmm. the really, well, I mean, a lot of the prominent trans games that we have um, deal with some at least fairly autobiographical stuff, um, or at least representations that are coming out of personal experience, right? Even if it's not intended to be an autobiography, it is, uh, I'm thinking, you know, for example, of Anna Anthropy's Dysphoria game, um, which is only available now. You can watch a video of it, but it's not publicly accessible online. But uh, that game, I mean, trans folks walking, it's not autobiographical or even biographical, but it's, it's still very rooted in personal experience, and I think a way that lends itself to autobiography. Interesting. All right, let's open up the floor for questions. You can post your question in chat or simply, um, Unmute yourself and ask directly. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, thank you so much, Cody. This was uh, such an excellent, rich presentation. Um, so I, I think you touched on this a bit with uh, your response to the last question in this kind of in between no futurity and looking towards futurity. Uh, kind of locating trans somewhere in the middle. Um, I'm also thinking about like common media tropes for queer and trans folks um, that rely so much on like coming out as like such a, a foundational moment for like the narrative or whatever the, the form is. Um, so like, um, love Simon, um, you know, it is about a kid who's coming out and navigating that process. Um, and I, I'm wondering, I uh, noticed that you mentioned Jasper Puar's work. Um, like, how these uh, narratives that, that are often offered to, like, the larger public um, of queer and trans lives um, if, you know, while representing queer and trans lives and bodies, experiences, um, if there's also kind of a, a weird maiming going on there, that we can only experience queer and transness in these moments, but, like, not allowing it to evolve. Or you can push back on, on that. Um, yeah, thank you. No, oh, I, yeah, thank you so much, um, Mike. I really like that question. And honestly, I wouldn't really push back on it because I think that there, 
I think that there is always an inherent limiting that goes on, especially when you are, you know, to put this in terms of sort of the narrative theory that I'm building in my book project, right? Once you have sequenced those signs into something, you know, one particular chain, then that's inherently limiting. Right? Like you've sort of like chopped off the other possibilities and arrived at one narrative, right? Um, and I think that the lived experience of that is quite different than, you know, what you get delivered via media or especially via pop culture. But I think that there is sort of a uh, narrative maiming that goes on, especially when it's a life that's condensed to a narrative in order to achieve something, right? Um, whether that be, you know, a particular respectability politics, whether that be a, um, the sort of, it gets better for, you know, youth kind of narrative where it's like, oh, don't, you know, look at all these successful people who have come out or have transitioned and that can be you too. And, and that's why I'm so ambivalent about it. And I don't mean to be like ambivalent in a way that's like, well, I don't know, but like, uh, I think that there can be reasons to arrive at that that can sometimes be at least well-intentioned even if they do have some drawbacks to them right like I can I can understand why and it, this is part of our motivation with trans folks walking why it can be a good thing to provide stories even if they're always already limited um to especially youth who might not be able to see those stories for themselves or might not be able to see those futures for themselves, right? Even as that I think is a narrative maiming, I can see why it's also a little bit of like, hey, here's some hope. There's, there, there could be the future here, right? Uh, and I know as a teenager, I really needed that. Um, and I do hope it provides that for other people with the caveat of one of my slides that said this too, right? There is no trans story. I don't know if that's just going to be like a thing that I say and no one listens to where it's like there is no one trans story but then people are like oh well trans folks walking is the trans story it's like no stop it that's not what this is for um I don't know if that's just the thing we're always going to have to be saying but yeah thank you I think Lindsay's next up with a question for you Cody Thank sure. you, Cody. Yeah. That was great. Thank you so much for sharing. And I just I noticed that you didn't plug your class with kids at All Right Knox, which looks fantastic. And like maybe later, if you have time to talk about that, I'd love to hear what you're doing with them. Um, OK, but here's the question. So um, not to out myself as someone who came to game studies in the early 2000s during the like the height of the ludologist, narrativologist um, culture wars. But um, when we're talking about like what's a trans narrative or even what's a trans game, it seems to me we're talking a lot about content, right? Or about story. Um, and I'm curious, like, are there are there ways of playing? Are there are there sort of ludic practices that you associate with being trans in some way or speaking to or like is I don't know exactly what the question is inside, but like, is there is there transness to a certain mechanic, or is there something about certain ways of playing that that need to be explored if we say we're exploring transness through game? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, that's fantastic, and I think that there are absolutely like, and I, I'm always so hesitant to keep going back to Ananthropy's dysphoria just because I know that. You know, she doesn't, that, that project is not necessarily publicly available anymore for a reason. It's because people took it up as like the empathy game for trans people. And that was really terrible. And she's like, stop it. No, we're not doing this anymore. But I think one of the things that that game is super amazing for is that it has a story to it, but like in the various sort of mini games that you're playing throughout it, it's distilling particular feelings into certain mechanics, right? Like mechanics of being seen or not seen, or, um, <coughs> excuse me, or the mechanics of like navigating certain spaces that I think could be said in those instances to be like particularly trans, right? Or to communicate a trans feeling. My hesitation, with sort of definitively saying, yes, there's this mechanic and it's trans, is I think that when you remove it from that context, then it's a way that people can be like, oh, well, I'm doing this thing, so I'm trans now. Or, you know, it's a way that like it, it becomes an abstract thing that then can be really easily appropriated. And that makes me really nervous in the same way that once I start talking about narrative in these sort of abstract theoretical ways, 
the danger there is it becomes really easy to appropriate, I think. And so for me, I always have to like want to bring it back to like, okay, but is the context, the lived experiences of LGBTQ people? Because if it's not, then I think that there could be still like a queerness or a transness to it, but I hesitate to be like, yeah, that's a trans mechanic. Thank you. And, okay. Um, if I could quickly plug too, because I think that these will run in the future. I'm hoping these will run in the future too. Um, uh, Famous Clark, uh, Joe Nobile, and I um, in Media Study are running a series of community youth game design classes with Albright Knox in Buffalo right now. It, it's a three-week class uh, that allows youth to come together um, and just start getting started with like making their own games, right? Um, so the first week we are kind of playing games together and figuring that out. This weekend we're going to be diving into actually making some prototypes of uh, the games that they want to make. Um, and by the end they will have at least a small game that they've made for themselves um, and I'm really excited for that sort of community program that's I, I'm always yeah very passionate about that fantastic thanks Cody I think Dave is the next one up and then we'll go to Rufa's question in the chat okay uh, a couple different things unrelated things so cut me off if we've got a limited time I don't know um, first one about the about the archive a question that occurred to me when you were talking about the one answering a question with that, I was wondering, it, have you done anything, are you doing anything to assess the quote unquote accuracy of the archive? And I'm not sure how this would actually be defined because it just occurred to me when you were saying about, I forget the exact question was, can we answer this thing about, is this a post 9-11 American trend or something? And how do we know the data that you're working from is enough to really answer that question? I'm thinking, you know, because it's a, you know, public community generated thing, I'm thinking about how, like, with Wikipedia, they would do these random studies of looking at articles and have field subject experts assess them compared to Encyclopedia Britannica. Are you doing anything like that with the archive? That has happened internally with the archive. Um, it, so basically what that process has looked like so far is people can submit sort of suggestions of games that will sort of generate an incomplete entry, but we don't consider it like a, a complete and full entry in the archive until it's been verified by kind of one of the core researchers working with it, right? So they've they've chased down sort of that lead, verified it, you know, either, you know, through various forms of documentation that could be multiple sort of blog or social media posts, it could be going back to the game itself, it could be looking for video record like recorded gameplay of the game to verify the thing being talked about but just to to make sure that yeah anything that's submitted to the archive that we have verified it in some sense that yes this thing exists and there's a sort of edited thing huh? mm -hmm. yeah the, the 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 difficulty there being that that's not that doesn't scale up super well with the yeah. exponential amount of content we have coming in so we're figuring out how do we still have that level you know some level of verification um, without just, you know, completely opening it to like anything that gets submitted is automatically an entry and we haven't verified any of it, but good luck. <laughs> and also when you said post 9-11, I started work, would have a little worry about uh, issues of recentism, recentness, that you're going to get a lot more information and content about recent games than 80s games and so forth. Um, but yeah, so the other thing was on the trans folk walking, um, I just wanted to say that, you know, so you're working with the, you know, HTC Vive kind of head mounted display as the, you know, standard VR. And I was thinking, you know, I come from, you know, cave background, of course, uh, projection based VR. And I'm thinking for what you're doing, that could provide, put, lead to a very different experience, certainly, and perhaps different questions as to what you want to make. Um, Michael Heim, in a couple of his books, talked about the cave as, he argued, you know, well, there was this long argument between projection-based and head-mounted displays as to what's true VR, and Heim argued that, you know, the cave is better because it's a much more embodied experience because you have your actual real body there in the environment as opposed to just this abstract point in an HMD. But for what you're trying to achieve, now you're stuck with your real body as opposed to having an avatar that can be anything you want. So not exactly a question, but raising this point that this is something that might provide you know, interesting questions or other considerations in uh, changing the, you know, or allowing for this other medium as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I would love to follow up with you about that, Dave, because I, honestly, I was, I was thinking about that this morning and getting ready for the talk today. We, we had kind of pitched around the idea of like, oh, well, what would transports walking look like if we wanted to turn it into a VR as opposed to just first person walking simulator kind of game, right? Um, but that's all, that's been that's still a very open question, really. Uh, that I, I don't really have a good answer to. Like, so I would be really curious to see to, to think with you and talk with you about what that might look like as a, you know a cave experience um, as opposed to a VR headset experience. Um, and yeah, I, I don't have like a, a great like answer or idea for that right now. But I, I would love to explore that option. Yeah, right now we have the headsets, but my, you know we used to have the projection set up, and I want to. My goal personally is to move back to that and start using the Vive tracking with projection type things. So we'll have space for that to try that out. Yeah, yeah that sounds great. Uh, Cody, we have a, a question here in the chat uh, from Arufa. Uh, the, you've discussed some very relevant and touchy topics today. What do you ultimately want us to take away from your presentation today? The what's at stake question. Yeah. Uh huh. That's a really, really great question. Um, I mean, I think for me, what the takeaway is, and uh, yeah, I guess I'll, we'll just go with this. Uh, like, what, what the takeaway for me is, and my interest in this is, is actually like my interest in these sort of like narrative sort of structures and theories and games is not necessarily just to understand games better, but. I think particularly like these sort of narrative processes we use, we're using all the time in our embodied navigation of the actual world. And so I think my takeaway would be, takeaway for everyone, that I hope everyone takes away from it, is that you have your own embodied story that you are constantly in the process of writing and telling, and that that is an important story. And my hope is that these sort of narrative ideas help in writing and telling that story. Maybe just give, you know, a different way of thinking about that. Like as you navigate your everyday lived experiences and, you know, sequence those signs and encounters into narratives for yourself that um, that those those are stories and those stories matter. Um, yeah. If you don't mind, I'm going to borrow that for my last class today on nonfiction, on creative nonfiction. <laughs> Absolutely. Go I'll cite you, of course. <laughs> well, that is that's a that's a, a great response, and it really is the essence of what you're doing. Already cited. <laughs> Thank then, you, Michael. It's kind of one of my biggest hopes for like the community youth uh, game design classes too. Is I mean, I just I, I hope that it's a space for them to explore. You know that they're their ideas and stories matter, right? And, you know, maybe it's building something small, you know, just getting started with it, but that that is important and um, and they should feel like it's important. They should feel like it, yeah. Sarah, pl please. Uh, yeah, I thought we were ending it at one, so I'll ask my question, but I, Cody, I could also ask this to, to you in the in the halls. Um, so there's a, there's a movement in documentary film right now that's sort of, pestering more mainstream to get rid of narrative. They hate narrative. Narrative is a dirty word. This has gone on every, you know, 15 years. Um, we can look back a hundred years almost, but I'm, and, and I have at times trying to reject it, but I come back to this and you've mentioned it, that our brains think in narrative um, and they do a hundred thousand years ago. I mean, anthropology looks at storytelling in, in human beings. And so it's been around. So I was just wondering how you think about non-narrativity in particular in like trans games. Mm -hmm. And and also I'm so naive about games. Can we have a game without narrative? Yeah, uh, those are really great questions, Sarah. Thank you. Um, I will admit to being sort of a card carrying narrativist in that like I see narratives everywhere. So like my answer to that second question is, I mean, I'm skeptical if there's a game that is completely absent of narrative because even if it's a, you know, a game or a media object that is decidedly against narrative, I think that it still will be narrativized by the people receiving it. So I think that there's always gonna be some sort of narrative involvement there. 
Um, but that's always been sort of at the core, I think, of some of those debates. It's, 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 it's nailing down exactly what people mean by narrative. Like for me, it's a very sort of expansive and very malleable sort of cognitive process. I think sometimes when people like rail against narrative, they're, they're railing against a particular, the particular way narrative is used or thought about that can be very limiting. And I, I get those frustrations with it. Um, so like I'm sympathetic to that, even though like I'm like, but like my personal understanding of narrative like isn't that thing that you really hate. Um, and, and so the first question was about non-narrativity in trans games. I think that that's a really core part of you know, when I was talking about my slides with the idea of like navigation in narrative, before like that sort of final sequence of events has, you know, we've arrived at that sequence, there's a navigation that happens that is kind of non-narrative, right? Like it isn't necessarily, and it might never coalesce in some instances in games too, right? There are some games that are more, they're less about telling a story and they're more about feeling something in a particular instance or giving you a puzzle to solve that will generate a particular feeling for you. Um, and I think that those, it, it's okay if those never really coalesce into a well-established narrative. I think that that can still be really valuable, right? Um, but I'm also a very both and kind of thinker. Like I'm like, yeah, look, you know, both things are really great. Why don't we do both? <laughs> Yeah, I, I just remember back in the day in Brighton at University of Sussex in Jacqueline Rose's seminar, The Psychoanalytic Critic, and she brought an American from London talking about um, anti-representational film as the cutting edge of the avant-garde in the 1980s. And it's interesting that that's having a resurgence. I'll have to ask the name of this filmmaker. It was a very prominent filmmaker where there would be nothing on the screen. <laughs> right and just just silence and it was it, and, and this is ha happening at the same time as AIDS and ACT UP and he was a queer filmmaker but it, it was it was a moment it was a moment um any questions any more I mean I have I have another one about the despair and the the affect you were talking about the melancholy and but isn't I've also noticed that that's in a young adult fiction more generally, um, you know, straight and and commercial young adult thirteen reasons why and and the prominence of suicide of cancer of I mean all of the major ones many of them being converted into films and all that there seems to be a, a more general sense what Raymond Williams would call a structure of feeling surrounding uh, the sense of despair and I, I I just wanted your thoughts to that rather than necessarily a particular subculture I've been seeing it much more widely. And I was wondering if it's connected or do you see them as distinct? I would definitely see them as connected. So like for Night in the Woods, for example, there are LGBTQ characters in that, but they are in, I would say the majority of the game, they're interacting with friends who are you know, cis heterosexual characters, right? And and it's not like it's just the LGBTQ ones who are, you know, dealing with melancholy or dealing with depression or dealing with loss. Um, there are other characters in the spaces too who are, are dealing with that same sort of loss. And, and even in some of the games I've used as examples, it's not like that sort of Rust Belt economic depression, you know, uh, living amongst the ruins, like that isn't, I think, a uni uniquely trans or queer thing. Um, but I, I would say that I, I wouldn't collapse them entirely either, right? Because I think like as that could be something that I think a lot of the characters are dealing with in the games I'm looking at. And, and I'm sorry that I'm, I'm gravitating toward those because I don't know much, especially about straight young adult fiction right now. Um, but uh, but, but even as like they might be dealing with some of the th same things, it's it's almost like that intersectional point, right? Of like, but there's also th that experience is also mediated for LGBTQ people by experiences of gender and sexuality that some of their classmates, friends, whatever, aren't necessarily dealing with at the same time, right? And that can lead to, I don't know, maybe um, an inflection of some of that affect. Or, and I would be really curious to see if there are the same sort of death rates amongst queer characters as there are in straight ones. My hunch would be that the one of the distinguishing factors there might be that LGBTQ characters tend to die more often. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and I can kind of back that up in games, but beyond that, I, I don't know if that trend holds. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And that's where the quantifiable aspect of your research is fascinating to answer those sorts of questions. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, Taylor has a question. Uh, sorry that um, they missed this because of work, but is there a brief takeaway that you would want to give to games people? Mm. A brief takeaway for games people. Um, God, I'm, I'm trying to decide between a couple of them right now. Maybe I'll just mention two brief ones. Um, I think one of them, one of them would be that if you are going to tell a trans or a queer narrative that is about more than just putting the character on the screen or in the in the narrative or whatever, right? It's not just about having you know a, a, a nominal presence, right? But that is, it's about some of these other things. It is about affect. It's about how that character navigates the space and social settings and things like that. Like that experience is fuller than just like, oh, I'm here and I'm gay and we'll never mention it again, right? Um, or, and it's not to say that that has to be the overriding quality of any sort of character narrative, but that there's more going on there than just, okay, we put them on the screen, we check the box, we're done. Um, and, oh shoot, what was the second thing? It might have escaped me. Um, yep, I think the second point has run away and I'm not sure if I'll get it back. Um, it was another sort of design related thing though. Um, uh, maybe it'll come back in a minute. <laughs> Is it connected to embodiment or what? I know I have the recording caption. I'm not sure if it was or not. Oh, the other thing I was going to say, and this is actually not just a queer or trans thing, but I think it's a really important design sort of um, uh, design lesson to learn. And I'm taking this actually from um, Beth Lepense, um, who's at Michigan State and works in indigenous games, but has often emphasizes in her talks that not every story is yours to tell. Right? Not every story is for you. Not every story belongs to you. Right, And sometimes there could be good reasons why someone doesn't want to share their story with you or, you know, it, those sorts of like ethical questions around storytelling, I think, are also very important with queer and trans stories and games. So and not to say that, you know, you have to stick to just your own experience when telling a story, but also think about that. Right. Like, is this story one that I should be telling? Is it one that I should have or demand access to? Or is this, you know, one that is better told by, you know, the person whose story or experience it is? Very good. All right, Taylor, do you have a follow-up query or? Oh, okay. You, you, you're, you're free to unmic yourself if you like, or we can read it aloud from the chat box, whichever you prefer. And for, we're going to be, for those of you who've asked about the recording, we do make sure that it is accessible so we get it properly captioned. All of our events are properly captioned through CAS and through our own office. And so we hope to post it on our YouTube channel in a week's time, probably a week, one week to two weeks. We'll have it there. Oh, okay, Taylor. Taylor's mic is having issues. Perhaps if you want, you could type it into the box, in the chat box. So Sarabi's put the link to the YouTube uh, Gender Institute channel there. So stay tuned as we wait to do this. And we'll be wrapping up shortly. Taylor's made me even more curious to read her fo the, the follow-up question. They're fo because I have no, i not sure if they're typing or not. Okay, my question is, as a trans designer, what can I take away and implement into my games today? If you had a dream game to design, what would you want? Great question, Taylor. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think my dream game is, it, it's honestly kind of what my team and I have been doing with trans folks walking. Like I, I always wanted to tell, I mean, to make a game that was based in in part, in, in, at this point it's a small part and I actually really like that of my own experience, but I've always really liked, I've been really passionate about community and community connection, so that sort of like community-based development where it's like inviting other people to become part of the project and to tell a, a variety of stories with a variety of perspectives. That's always been kind of what my dream game is. Those are some of the things that really motivate me. Um, a thing to take away and implement in your games today. 
Um, I think the thing that one of the things my team and I have thought a lot about and are still ongoing thinking about, um, it's, I, I think in, in terms of like, uh, and, and not to say, you know, Taylor, maybe the games you're making aren't necessarily trans games or they're not about trans experiences or stories, but um, one of the takeaways I would offer would be about framing content, right? Like, as we've been delving into making our levels for trans folks walking, we've really wanted to do as much as we can possibly do to prevent the game from being read as an empathy game, where it's like letting other people be like, this is what it's like to be trans. Once you play this game, you'll know what it's like to be trans. We do not want this game to be viewed that way. We don't want it to be played that way. Like if people play the game and they, you know, learn something from it, wonderful, but this is not meant to be like the trans game, right? And so the thing I would offer there would be thinking about, and I think this goes for other identities or stories too, what that intended audience experience is and, and trying to do your best to frame it in a way that it won't, and you can never do this completely, but that it won't be misconstrued as something that it's not or you don't want it to be. Um, we've done that in the, the specific sort of design things we've implemented for that have been, um, uh, each level has a, is framed both by sort of like an introduction and sort of an outro or conclusion to the level that uh, offers a bit about the context. It also offers options and reminders for, um, you know, this is not, you know, one trans experience, this is not the trans experience. Um, and so we've done our best to sort of frame each level in a way that will hopefully get people it, out of that sort of headspace, right? Where it's like, this is what the, this is an empathy game and it's all about this one experience. That's interesting. I hadn't heard of that phrase before, empathy game, but you've come back to that point a number of times, Cody, that you didn't want, you don't want certain works to be easily appropriated. And I, you know, I understand where that's coming from, but I'm wondering how much control do you as a, as a designer or one as an author have in how one's work is going to be interpreted or read? Frankly, not a lot, uh, which is, I think, why it's such a, <laughs> a standing point of concern. Because, I mean, frankly, once it's out there, I mean, people yeah. can take it yeah. almost whatever they want with it, right? right? And and I think that that's what led, I mean, and we've seen it play out kind of time and time again with games, you know, by trans folks telling trans stories that um, it often does get sort of uh, taken and used in ways that the creators are not, like sometimes really deeply uncomfortable with or really deeply don't like. And that's what led Anna Anthropy to take dysphoria down. That's why you can't download it or play it anywhere because... Uh, you know, she said that, that that's not what this game was for and, you know, it's time for this game to not be available anymore. You can go still go watch like a YouTube video of it, but, and so like I've seen that happen time and time again. Maybe it's like a, a naive hope that people like if we do these things will maybe take it a bit more seriously, but at the very least it, it like puts us on the record of being like, hey, you know, you can take and do what you want with it, but, you know, our intention was not for it to be bad. Yeah. And that's probably a good strategy to do, you know, to, to document that intention, and, but at the same time, acknowledge the limits of that in, in terms of how it's consumed and interpreted. Yeah. Fascinating. And so many connections to the literary and reader response theory. Is a book only truly read when the reader picks it up from the shelf and actually engages? Is it the reader, the, uh, is the reader the ultimate writer of a text? Uh, in, in, in yeah, absolutely. Theory? All right. Well, if there's no more questions, I'll, I'll just give a few. If anyone wants to join in the conversation, I know everyone's busy this last week of classes, uh, but I, you know, I think we'll wrap it up. And Cody, I just want to thank you. I've been so curious to hear more about your work, and this has been fantastic. And thank you so much for ending a, 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 our, our Frost series on such a high note. Uh, this semester and i want to thank all of you for joining us and uh, have a wonderful holiday gear up because we have a really really great lineup of events uh, and a busy lineup of events for the spring so have a great holiday everyone thank and happy new welcome. year yeah happy new year <laughs>